I did it. I played every Fire Emblem game. Was it worth it? No. Fire Emblem, the tactical RPG series that has captured the hearts of millions. This massive franchise has 15 original games, 3 remakes, and 4 spin-offs, coming to a total of 22 games, and I'm here to rank each one. I'll be ranking the 3 games tied to Fates, Birthright, Conquest, and Revelation separately, and each remake will be separate from the original. This is a completely subjective list based on my own opinions. The odds of you fully agreeing is slim jim to none. Please respect my opinion, and don't write a thousand word long comment because you won't sway me and I probably won't read all of it. Save that argumentative essay for something more worthwhile. We have a lot to get through, so let's jump into this. Back in 2013, I took a good look at myself in the mirror and told myself to get my sh** together and finally play the original Fire Emblem. Fire Emblem, Shadow Dragon, and the Blade of Light. What a mouthful. I slapped a fan translation on that baby, which forever ruined my pronunciation of Hikata, Shida, Sita, whatever her name is. This game is awful. It's horrendous. Being the first in the series, I shouldn't expect much, but I have not played a game that has aged worse than this. I would rather play Zelda 2 over this. Actually, I probably wouldn't. The game is very bare bones. Minimal story, basic and frustrating map design, annoying hit rates, it's not good. It was a promising start to the series in the 90s, and I'm sure it was fun in the 90s. But it's best left in the 90s, just like Backstreet Boys. Yeah. In fact, this is the only Fire Emblem game I did not finish because it was miserable. And because I found a hot deal on the remake, Shadow Dragon. I know, I didn't finish this Fire Emblem and I say that I finished every Fire Emblem, but this one is so unbearable. Oh, I'd... <laughs> maybe someday I'll finish it, but not anytime soon. <laughs> what bothers me about this title is that Nintendo decided to localize and port this game in 2020, rather than porting its remake to the Switch, or maybe even localizing the sequel's remake, a game we never got in the West. Why port the worst version of this story? I understand game preservation and all that jazz, it's cool and all, and, it, and it's great to see the roots of the series, but just one new mystery. Why didn't you localize new mystery? At least we got an amazing trailer for it. I mean, who is he anyway? Wait, you don't know Marth? What game is he even from? You don't know Fire Emblem? I don't know. What's that? Oh, come on. Fire Emblem? This kid should not be that excited. The placement of this next Fire Emblem title shocked me. To set the stage, I'm not someone who trashes Fire Emblem Fates on a daily basis. It's more like a bi-weekly basis. There are some people out there who act like Fates killed their dog. I absolutely acknowledge the many flaws in Fates, but it did some things right. I don't think people talk about that enough. At the end of the day, I like Fates overall. Yeah, it has flaws, but there is so much good in it. But we won't talk about the good just yet, because I have to talk about the bad of the bad. The baddest of the bad. The baddest, baddest, bad of the bad. Revelation is a disaster. Revelation is the third in canon route for Fates. It's where the protagonist, Korin, doesn't choose either side in the historic Hoshido Nor War. Instead, they try to find a solution to appease both sides, which is dumb. Stop being such a damn centrist, Korin. Kill people, come on! The story reeks of stupidity chapter after chapter, and I could go on about its issues for literal hours, but I'll sum it up in one sentence. Don't jump off a bridge because your friend does. At the end of the day, the story isn't nearly as offensive as the gameplay. Overall, Fate's combat is really good, like some of the best in the series. 
they added balancing to the pair-up mechanic, had really neat classes, and had some very fun ideas overall. It was a fantastic step in the right direction. But the quality level of map design varies from game to game, and Revelation is rock bottom quality. Where is this, SpongeBob? Rock bottom. Every map in this game is gimmicky, from a far too long labyrinth to a field of flames to moving blocks to an elevator. A stupid fing elevator. At least the elevator has great music. I like having gimmicks and maps when it comes to tactical RPGs, but Revelation had an oversaturation of gimmicks. It feels necessary to activate the gimmicks to defeat the enemy, when it should be more optionally activate the gimmicks to get an edge on the enemy. God, I love shoveling snow! The maps are a mess, but I do credit intelligence systems for trying new things. When this first released, I was a hard defender of Revelation, but as time has gone on, I've realized I was a clown. Fate isn't as bad as people make it out to be, but Revelation deserves to get trashed a bit. And by a bit, I mean a lot. I don't know why I wrote down a bit. I mean a lot. It, it's not good. Hey, at least you could use every unit. Except Izana, who I had forgotten existed up until about five minutes ago. In 2017, Fire Emblem fans were eating so well. We had just came off of three Fire Emblem games with Fates in 2016. Fire Emblem Warriors came out, which was a fan crossover many dreamed of happening. And then the remake of the second Fire Emblem game, Gaiden. And then finally, the most successful Fire Emblem game of all time released in 2017. Fire so, hey, look at us. Look at us. Huh? Who would have thought? Not me. Heroes is a gotcha mobile game that's just begging you to drop money on precious PNGs of your favorite characters. This game exploded in popularity over the years, and I still actively play it about two hours a week. It's not great, but it's a constant in my life, and the art's really nice. I love to go swimming, don't you? Oh my god, she's so pretty! <laughs> the actual game itself isn't anything special. Units move one to three spaces on a small map, and the story is a mess of mythology, dreams, missing characters, plot holes, and death. It's neat, I guess, but it feels like I'm learning a story as unnecessary complex and deep as Kingdom Hearts all over again. His heart's inside my heart. The game revolves around building the best units with skills you gained from other units and actively keeping your units up to date as more units enter the summoning pool with new skills that will make your units better. <sighs> and that style of game is just not for me. I was more into the unit building aspect in the first year, but after spending hundreds of dollars for Bride Sita and a depression episode, I stopped spending as much time in it, and stopped spending money altogether. Except on Resplendent Alencia. Oh, my favorite Fire Emblem character of all time. God, she's radiant. Heroes only rank so low because it's just not for me. I'm just not big brain enough to wrap my head around every skill. My IQ is just flat out not high enough for Fire Emblem heroes. Anyway, I believe in Sharina supremacy. In 2013, I sat in my college class playing the second Fire Emblem game, Fire Emblem Gaiden. I looked over to one of my best friends and said, This game has so much potential. If it was remade, it would be one of the best Fire Emblem games ever. Four years later, I was right. But we'll talk about that later. For now, let's talk about the original game. Fire Emblem Gaiden. Gaiden itself is a great game in the 90s, just like Fire Emblem 1, except better. As for today, I like to call Gaiden a fantastic proof of concept. Gaiden took the original Fire Emblem formula and expanded upon it in very creative ways. Explorable cities, caves, and castles, there was an overworld, three tiers of promotions for certain units with one tier being completely up to the player, and eliminating my biggest complaint of every tactical RPG. Benching units. It's like a middle school sports team. No one's benched. 
I will forever praise Gaiden for these changes because they were super ahead of its time. These were modern day mechanics in 1991. That's impressive. Of course, it's still a 90s game. It's slower than a pizza driver in a snowstorm. Crash this car, but still delivers the pizza. <laughs> the hit rates are lower than my self-esteem, and the story is so bare bones, you'd think a first grader wrote it. Not saying it's not a good story, there's just no meat to it. Vegans love it. I love Gaiden. It truly opened my eyes when I played it, but it's just so inferior to other titles. Thank goodness we got a remake. From here on out, every game I list is, at the very least, average. And the most average Fire Emblem goes to the one and only, Shadow Dragon, the DS remake of the original Fire Emblem. The reason this game ranks so low is because of its source material. The original Fire Emblem is iconic, but it hasn't aged super well. The maps aren't great, the story isn't special, and most characters are beyond forgettable. These are all things I mentioned in number 22, but I have to bring it back because this is a remake. I know there's definitely a following for this game, I've met many people who say that Shadow Dragon is one of their favorites, and I respect it. It just didn't provoke any fun, funny feelings for me and any happy, giddy smiles. I remember I finished the game while waiting in line for the midnight release of Pokemon X and Y. I closed my 3DS, looked to my friend, and said to her, That was average. I'm very happy that they finally gave Marth the character he deserved. I fell in love with Marth in Fire Emblem 3, Mystery of the Emblem, and that same Marth came through in the remake. He and a few others like Sita, Sheeta, Keita, whatever, Hardin, Tiki, Lind, The White Wings, Camus, Michalis, and Zane. They're all great, and they pretty much carry this game for me. I'm still angry that Camu wasn't in Fire Emblem Warriors, what the fuck? The absolute worst thing about this remake are the animations. Oh lordy lord lord gelatin. We have this beautiful art style for the portraits. Marth looks great. Navarre looks great. This art style is gorgeous. Then you go into battle and what the sh is that? It's like you have this beautiful chowder in front of you, so creamy and milky and it just looks so tasty. But then someone spills a whole can of pepper and it's just ruined. Oh, sugar pops. I'll never understand this animation style. It's just so gross to me. Thankfully, you can turn animations off, but the animations are part of what makes Fire Emblem so great. Oh well, still an all right game. Roy, 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 he's our boy. Binding Blade, an average game I played. Fire Emblem The Binding Blade, the game that nearly every fan considers to be the weakest Game Boy Advance Fire Emblem title. And I agree, but I probably like it more than most, as I see a lot of people trash this game to no end. I nearly put this a few spots higher, but I haven't played this in 10 or so years, so my current opinion isn't super reliable. This game follows the Smash Brothers legend Roy on his quest to defeat Zephyl's racist bomb. It's very similar to Shadow Dragon in terms of plot beats, but slightly creates its own identity, making it a bit stronger than the former. I, I didn't actually fall asleep playing this one, unlike Shadow Dragon. At the end of the day, Roy isn't anything special. Most of the cast isn't anything special, save for Wolt, the GOAT. Oh, I love my starting archers. What really heightens this game in my eyes are the antagonists. Two in particular, Zephiel, the major racist who believes dragons are superior, and the terrifying psychotic Narcian. They absolutely make this game. I don't care about Roy. Tell me about Narcian's blood fest. Show me how he murders innocents. I need to see that. I need that. And a therapist. Show me more of Zephiel's rise to power. There's so much good hiding under the average soil here. Unfortunately, it has its share of bad elements, like maps. A lot of bad maps. A lot. Arcadia! Binding Blade is one of the two Fire Emblem games that comes with real busted units. It is so much fun plowing through every map with absolute monsters of units. I don't have many negatives to say about this for now, but when we reach the other Game Boy Advance titles later on, I'll reveal my nasty little issues with all GBA Fire Emblem games. I, I love Roy. And I, I mean in Smash, not Binding Blade. 
Lilina is my real protagonist. You've betrayed your family and Hoshido. Just kidding, it's Fireball Fate's birthright. I went on and on about Fates with Revelation, so I'll try to keep this one brief. As said before, Fates' combat is superb, and that really carries the game. Again, a birthright did something that no other entry in this long-standing series has done, and I don't think it gets enough credit. In Birthright, the protagonist, Korin, picks the side of Hoshido, and Hoshido is completely based off of Japan, which is very, very refreshing in this European medieval dominated franchise. And because of this, they had to change the unit classes. Marmadins are now Samurai, Warriors are now Onis, Ninjas exist, Kinshi Knights, Basara, and a bunch of other Japanese inspired classes. As someone who was pretty tired of the medieval European theme, this was such a welcome change. It felt like a whole new set of classes that I had never touched before, when in reality, they weren't at all. They were just different names with slight differences. But that was enough for me, that, that made me happy. I spent far more time in the barracks upgrading and class changing units in Birthright compared to the other two entries in Fates. It was honestly magical. Unfortunately, that was one of the only few good things about Birthright. The cast was very lackluster. Most retainers were snooze fest, the royals weren't very interesting, Lobster Lord was more interesting in the partner game Conquest, Pineapple was far more interesting in Conquest, much to my great friend Custom SC's dismay, even Hinoka was more interesting in Conquest by a mile. And Sakura just exists. I still don't know why she exists. Why are you here? Beyond the cast, the maps are just okay. They aren't anything special, they're basic. And the story, well, it's probably the most stable out of all the Fates games? But that's not saying much because it still has plenty of issues. Birthright is good, but it's not great, you know? Wow, look at that. Seven entries in and we're already two-thirds done with Fates. Who would have thought? How do you make a sequel to the Fire Emblem title I consider to be the worst? By adding a damn good story. Mystery of the Emblem, the third entry in the Fire Emblem series, took me by surprise. Going into this game in 2014, I was expecting the worst of Fire Emblem 1 to carry over. Land Marth, slow gameplay, lame characters. But then I got to the title screen and heard this. Oh, bananas! This is still one of the best renditions of the Fire Emblem theme! Mm, mm, mm. Mystery of the Emblem takes the story of Fire Emblem 1 and slaps some real narrative in there. You know those dudes you rode with in the original game? Yeah, they're evil now. Damn, that kind of sucks. F them up! This is a classic rebellion story with Marth at its head. It's fascinating to see all these characters from Shadow Dragon years later. It's like they cared about the writing! This is when Fire Emblem began getting very, very good. I actually care about Arcanea now. Of course, it still has its shortcomings. As I love to say a million times, it's a 90s game. Annoying maps, low hit rates, awkward RNG, the game goes on a bit too long, the story is fluffy, and there are so many characters that quite a few of them get tossed to the side. But what matters most is Nina and Camus' tragic story. Look for the girl with a broken smile. DSFE, also known as the Arcanea Saga. This is such a special title that most people don't know. This short addition to Mystery of the Emblem debuted in Japan through a streaming add-on for the SNES, the Satellaview. It came with four chapters that took place before the beginning of the first Fire Emblem. Its main focus is Kamu and Nina's relationship, alongside fleshing out some other characters like Rickard, Lena, and Navarre. 
I unfortunately didn't get to play the original version of this because it's very tough to find. But Intelligent Systems was super duper and added it to Mystery of the Emblems Remake. So I experienced it there. I knew about this game for years, but I never played it. And with a name like BSFE, I thought it would be garbage, cause you know. Bullshit. But it was actually really neat. Arcanea is easily my second favorite world in all of Fire Emblem, so seeing more history unravel in it was fantastic. The gameplay is no different than the core game it's attached to, whether it's mystery or new mystery. There aren't any new elements that make it stand out, it's simply the story that has me ranking this as high as I am. It's such a good little tale! Also this has Belf. All hail Belf! I anticipate catching some serious heat for not just this pick, but my next few picks. And starting off with a banger, Fire Emblem Warriors. Boo! You stink! Everyone hates this game, and I understand the frustration, I just don't understand the hate. Fire Emblem Warriors is a crossover with Dynasty Warriors and Fire Emblem. It's a hack and slash RPG about capturing and defending fortresses. It's a simple, harmless, fun little title. Unfortunately, this game chose to only pull primarily from three games. Fire Emblem Shadow Dragon, Awakening, and Fates. The cast was not very diverse to say the least. And I don't mean in skin color. Almost none of Fire Emblem is diverse in that subject. <laughs> its cast pushed thousands of fans into a fiery rage. To make things even worse, the plot is basically a copy and paste of the story from Awakening and Fates when introducing the respective characters. Which is a shame. Because of this, the story mode is pretty underwhelming. But there was one very, very big saving grace for me with this title. History mode. The reason why this ranks higher than the nine other Fire Emblem games is because of history mode. History mode allows the player to traverse maps from previous titles and take on enemies through battles. This was such a lovely homage to the games being represented, and it was a really nice visual progression system that I put over a hundred hours into. The gameplay found in Warriors games isn't really my favorite, but I enjoyed this game's combat far more than other Warriors games because it wasn't as gimmicky and it gave me the power fantasy of mowing down thousands of enemies with iconic Fire Emblem characters. It was a childhood dream come true. When it comes to critiquing a game, I often like to say, judge the game for what it is rather than what it isn't. And while that doesn't fit every situation, it fits here like a glove. So many people wrote this game off because it didn't have characters like Ike, Alm, or Selif or Leaf. But what's present in the base game is a pretty solid package if you're a Fire Emblem fan. I don't get it, Fire Emblem fans love packages. I will admit I'm a bit easy on this game because I have some lovely memories tied to it. Such as playing this all day right before one of my friend's wedding, and finally getting Celica's Lady Blade at 2 in the morning with the help of my friend. This game never fails to make me smile. It's not the best game, but it's a damn fun one. It's just stupid fun. And I wish more people gave it an actual chance. Now, I'm talking about the base game because the DLC on the other hand... Yeesh! Ugh, that's scummy. Strap in your seatbelts, bust out that popcorn, ready those angry typing fingers. Number 12 goes to Fire Emblem 7, The Blazing Blade. Blazing Blade suffers from what I like to call too ambitious for its platform. This game is all about a massive struggle against the Black Fang, which is essentially a mercenary organization. It's a grandiose story with so many moving parts and important interactions stuck on the Game Boy Advance. Because of the GBA, every Fire Emblem game suffered heavily in story, characters, and especially music. The abysmal GBA sound system has ruined so many soundtracks in the GBA era, and Fire Emblem was caught in the crossfire. 
Just imagine how good this would sound on literally any other console. Enough about the music, let's talk actual content. Because of the GBA limitations, again, several design choices were made that um, make me very angry. Before I begin thrashing Blazing Blade into oblivion, I need you to know that I believe this story in this game is a great one. I'm super invested in the story, I love a good amount of the characters, and overall it's a very strong entry in the franchise. It just could be more. The GBA forced developers into questionable narrative elements that hardcore GBA Fire Emblem fans love to defend to no end. <sighs> Limited supports. Each character gets 5 supports per playthrough, which is fine. Seems fine. There probably isn't too much importance behind these supports, just deepening character backstories. Nope. So many of these supports contain critical pieces of the plot and world of the game, and it won't tell you which support with who will trigger these vital conversations. I, and so many others, probably like 98% of Fire Emblem players, went through all three GBA Fire Emblem games and missed out on so much lore and story because of these limited supports. How am I supposed to know to pair up character A with character B to learn about this one essential piece of the plot? It's the worst when they lock it behind a unit that's not very good. The game doesn't say anything. Why would the developers hide their plot behind optional supports? Because of replay value. Games that are developed for replay value just make me angry. I say that as I love Nier Automata. Why gamble that your game is good enough to play more than once? Especially a 20 to 30 hour long tactical RPG. GBA Fire Emblem began my frustrations with Force Replay, and then Three Houses cemented my frustrations further. A little touch on that another time. Whenever I try bringing up how this is poor narrative design, GBA lovers relentlessly defend this game and act like I murdered their goldfish or something. I just want one story, one playthrough. If the game is good enough to be played more than once, it should be treated as an extra, not a necessity. The first playthrough should not rely on subsequent playthroughs. Blazing Sword falls below my next pick simply because the villain of this game, Nurgle, is the flattest plank of wood ever in your first playthrough. But in the second playthrough, in Hector mode, you find out he's actually a really interesting and complex villain. But why the hell do I have to play the game twice to actually care for the villain? That should be a first playthrough situation. I literally struggle recommending the GBA era of Fire Emblem to anyone because of these illogical design choices. I get so frustrated. Defend it all you want in the comments, I'm sure I'm gonna get several DMs saying you're just dumb. I will not read an essay you write because I've seen the argument a thousand times. It just comes down to this design choice not making sense to me. I'm frustrated because I care. Because this story is truly magnificent. This world is great. The central characters are really neat. Except Lin. Can you really call her a central character? She's more like a babysitter for the first 10 chapters and then bugs off for the rest of the game. Ooh, I'm gonna get attacked for that one. This game is in desperate need of a remake. Package it with a sequel, prequel, binding blade, whatever you want to call it. And you have yourself potentially the greatest Fire Emblem game ever. But for now, it's eternally trapped on the godforsaken Game Boy Advance. Now that I'm being flamed for not liking Blazing Sword as much as everyone else, time to trash my favorite Game Boy Advance Fire Emblem. Oh, this is gonna be worse. Sacred Stones! Now the whole restricted supports and garbage audio quality still applies. The soundtrack is a bit better, I'll give it that. But the supports are arguably worse. They hide even more important things behind supports. 
like the entirety of Lara Shell's backstory and motivation. You know, a pretty central character. The logic continues to baffle me. But then again, this whole game's logic baffles me. I would love to point to the wild chapter where they storm the castle with four men, but I guarantee someone has written a thesis-length essay on why that chapter makes sense. I don't want to be too harsh to Sacred Stones. I do love it the most out of all the GBA games. I just love the scope of the story. It's a small, personal story between Ephraim, Erica, and their friend Leon, Lion... Why are there so many unpronounceable names in Fire Emblem? This is far better for this console. Compared to Blazing Sword and Binding Blade Story, it's more contained, it's far easier to follow, and there are less central characters, and because of all that, this game left more of a lasting impression on me when I first played Blazing Sword and Sacred Stones in 2007. And most importantly, the maps are pretty awesome in Sacred Stones. Most maps in these two GBA games are solid, but Sacred Stones has the best consistency for high quality maps. Oh, I love them. There, there's some really great maps in Sacred Stones. Oh my god. Although I always laugh at the art style of this game, because sometimes there's this huge melodramatic scene happening in the battle, and then I look at the portrait sprite. <laughs> <laughs> what? Sacred Stones is a good game. My favorite GBA Fire Emblem game. I have issues with it, but hey, that's why it's only 11th place. For years and years, I loathed Fire Emblem Awakening. I was a full-blown Fire Emblem elitist. I overused that toxic phrase, Awakening is a good game just not a good Fire Emblem game. Years later, when I met many of my online friends, my perception of Awakening and the series changed into how I feel today. Awakening is a great Fire Emblem game, and my number 10 spot. Honestly, we should just make a religion after Awakening. This saved the franchise! Hallelujah! Hallelujah. Awakening was the first Fire Emblem for the 3DS. It was also the swan song for the entire franchise. This was supposed to be the end, until BAM 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 this bad boy sold so much! This was the explosion of Fire Emblem, and likely your first Fire Emblem game. This game follows Krom in Robin's Adventure, a thousand years after Marth. It's um, the story. The first 11 or so chapters are just fantastic. But after that, it gets, um, a bit fluffy and has some gaping plot holes and partially unnecessary conflict. Not a huge fan after chapter 11, but those first chapters are great. The combat is incredibly refined and introduces the pair-up mechanic to mainstream romancing boys or girls. Unfortunately, this system made the game an incredibly unbalanced mess. But that's fine. It was still fun. The maps in this game are not great, they're basic. Beyond the 90s Fire Emblem games, I think Awakening has one of the weakest set of maps. I think only a handful really stuck out to me, because they're so vanilla. At one point I didn't think maps could get worse than Awakenings. And then Revelation happened, and Three Houses happened. But I'll dig into that later. What I want to dig into now is the soundtrack, baby! Fire Emblem as a series has some bangin' bops, but no other entry smacks down as raw as Awakenings. This was a pleasant surprise for the Western audience because the soundtrack that came before Awakening was Shadow Dragon, which is... Uh, eh. And then before that was Radiant Dawn, which was... Uh. Awakening launched the series into a soundtrack resurgence because the following games had killer beats. Fates, Shadows of Valentia, Heroes, and even Warriors. Those soundtracks pleasantly, consistently, and consensually penetrate my ear holes. Oh yeah. Damn, Three Houses, why'd you have to ruin the music high? Check out my nifty Three Houses soundtrack review. Awakening is fantastic, 
Thank God it exists, because this series was dead. And back then, I never thought it would have a resurgence like this. Hallelujah! This is the last time I bring up everyone's most hated game, Fates. Grab a stamina potion because I'm sure you're fatigued by now. Fire Emblem Fates Conquest. This game, this game, this game! I genuinely love Conquest. I know it has some rancid shortcomings that everyone spreads around like peanut butter, but no one ever spreads around the good parts of this peanut butter and jelly sandwich. The jelly. This story is garbage. It's a steaming pile of incest, angst, breasts, and DLC baiting. And it's a story that I toxically defended back in 2016. Goodness, what was wrong with me? There are some really neat things I liked about this story, actually. Takumi is fantastic. Hinoka actually has depth. Ryoma is flawed. Sakura still does jack shit. Burning Scarlet to death. Boots. The final boss. Iago, Iago, Azura's dancer outfit, and it feels like you're on the wrong side, and I love that. Unfortunately, it doesn't feel like you're truly committing potentially evil deeds, which is what I wanted from Conquest, but that's okay, because Conquest walked so Crimson Flower could run. The game succeeds in gameplay and map design. I previously praised Fates' gameplay, and I can praise it all day. Oh, man, what good combat. <laughs> Let's talk about what this specific game really excels at. The maps! Oh, the maps! Mm, goodly goodness, these maps make my tummy rumble in all the right ways! Oh! Chapter 10, the port map! Oh! The Great Wall with Takumi, yes! The Staircase of Death, I really like that one! Of course, there are some bad maps in Conquest, but the good outshine them so hard. Conquest is a good game. I love Conquest. It's just, it's so good. I just wish it had a better story. And maybe some better characters. D did we really need Perry? Time to play! At least we got Arthur. Justice. It's okay to dislike the game. Just don't be irrational or toxic about it. That's all. I love Conquest. New Mystery of the Emblem. This is the latest addition to my list. I actually never beat New Mystery of the Emblem up until a few weeks ago. It was the last full Fire Emblem game I never finished. Besides Fire Emblem 1, but that's, that's garbage, we don't talk about that. New Mystery is fabulous, what an experience, oh I love it! For years and years I put off New Mystery because I loved the original Mystery so much. And I heard a lot of chitter chatter about the obnoxious additions with Chris and Katarina. I'm gonna be honest with you, they are so overblown. They were great. Super unpopular opinion coming through. But I really liked Chris. I thought he was a really neat element added to the story. And his story was pretty interesting. Sure, he's a bit of a perfect panda, but which Avatar character isn't? Like, honestly. I probably like him the most of all the Avatar characters, but don't tell people that because I'll, I'll get eviscerated. As for the actual game, it's great. It's Mystery of the Emblem, but better. More writing, base conversations, more context to the story. It's one of my favorite stories in Fire Emblem, filled with a bunch of hit or miss characters. I love George, but you know, Warren just doesn't do it for me. This gives my baby boy, my hubby boo, my boogaloo Harden more time in the spotlight, and he deserves the world. Precious baby. Oh, I love you. And the music slaps! Oh! I'm not a huge fan of the DS sound system, but at least it isn't the GBA sound system. I'm actually still quite upset, very upset actually, this never got localized. More people need to experience this game, this, this story, these characters, the maps, everything. This is such a fulfilling title in the franchise. I can't recommend it enough. As previously mentioned, I think most handheld games are shafted because of the hardware, which is the case here. If this was on a home console, it would be top 5 for me. Also, you know, if they did away with those disgusting fighting animations, it's better, but still, it's uh, not good. 
It still feels like a 90s game here and there, which is one of the downsides I have with this game. Also, the cast is still pretty big and pretty forgettable. I, I honestly could not even name half of the cast, probably. Sorry. But it's still great. New Mystery of the Emblem is a great game. By the way things were proceeding, I'm sure the assuming viewer thought Genealogy of the Holy War would fall in the top three. Not today, friend, as it is number seven. The first major plunge into heavy narrative in the franchise, Genealogy of the Holy War is renowned by the veterans in the community as one of, if not, the greatest game to ever exist. Honestly, it's pretty great. I can't deny this game's excellence. It exceeds in so many places that most Fire Emblem games fail. It's delicious. But it's not all sparkly rainbows and cake. It has a lot of dull downtime. Genealogy is built around remarkable moments that are burned into my memory. As soon as I saw this scene, I sh** myself. It's scenes like these that carry this game hard. The in-between quiet moments between these loud and iconic scenes are where it lacks. Now I know most genealogy players hate hearing this argument, but if you have never seen a map from this game, here it is. Holy cow! Gigantic! Biggest thing within the tri-state area! When people said that Ridley was too big for Super Smash Brothers, they were wrong. When people say that genealogy maps are too big, they are right. I completely understand the design they were going for. Giant war, with a giant story, on giant maps. This game was meant to be a behemoth, and it worked in the 90s. And just like all the other 90s games on this list, it has not aged very well. It makes what could be a 20 to 30 hour adventure into a 40 to 50 hour padded adventure. There is so much walking. If I wanted a lot of walking, I would just pop in Lord of the Rings for the umpteenth time. Frodo and Sam are gay besties. Oh my god, I love them. The big draw to genealogy is the juicy licious plot. Ugh. Mmm. The game is split into two parts. The first part follows the stoic paladin Sigurd and his band of buddies, while the second part follows Selif and his band of broken men and women. From what I've seen, everyone really loves part two. And while I personally enjoy part two, it feels very generic Fire Emblem, whereas part one is a breath of fresh air with meaningful political discourse among a brewing war. And that's a scrumptious biscuit of a story right there. Ah, oh, yeah. As for the cast, it's a massive upgrade from Mystery of the Emblem. The cast is smaller, and you have far more intimate moments with them thanks to the romance mechanic. There are still a few that get thrown to the side, but the central cast is quite pleasant. Despite its faults, Genealogy is an epic story that could use an upgrade in a lot of places. It's one of the few Fire Emblem games that feels like there's an actual war going on, and I vibe with that hard. If this game gets remade, this list will be rewritten to all hell. Oh man, please remake it. Fire Emblem has been on a massive upswing these days, and that's incredible. I've touched on it briefly, but as someone who has followed this series closely since Path of Radiance, I never thought I would see this series thrive as much as it currently is. And the best part? Despite the game having more of a worldwide appeal, it hasn't sacrificed quality. Mostly. Fire Emblem Three Houses is an amazing game that falls short of my personal top five. Why are you boring me? I'm right! Before you consider me dead for not putting this at number one, Please hear me out. I've done every route in this game. I've played the DLC. I've put in over 200 hours in this game. I've made an entire team of Pegasus units. I love this game. It's so great. There are just some things that this game does that really rustles my burnt popcorn. I'm jumping into the negative first so we can end on a positive and so I get less comments from loyalists who say my opinion is wrong. This game's biggest fault to me are the multiple routes. I mentioned my frustrations with the replay value being forced into a game with the GBA titles. So this should be no surprise. 
I quite enjoy when a game allows me to make choices that change the narrative. That's really sick. As long as it doesn't diminish the overall quality. Three Houses is the pristine example of diminishing quality for a narrative gimmick. Having four different routes is awesome. You can pick the Angry Black Eagles, the Way Too Serious For My Taste Blue Lions, or the Objectively Best House Golden Deer. Depending on what you choose, you'll fall down one of three routes, and a fourth one opens up if you join the most likely to be canon house, Black Eagles. That's so much game. You can go through four routes. Pretty nifty, huh? Not at all. Because this game was so heavily focused on different routes, it lacked other areas. Most notably, the maps. You know when I said Awakening had a pretty lackluster set of maps? Yeah, Three Houses is just flat out worse. The maps are horrendous. Not all maps are awful. Some are pretty decent, but that's only maybe two or three maps out of the 15 or so we ended up with. They gave us such a measly amount of maps to cover 200 plus hours of gameplay. Why? What were they thinking? Because of the lack of map diversity, this also heavily impacted the story. Like, every route has to go on this stupid bridge, or go in this dumb lava cave, because they had to force the plot in that direction because it took less development time than making a new map. The maps literally make me want to go full on white bro and punch a wall. The narrative felt unnecessarily padded in the second half of the game. It felt like we were retreading old ground in every single route. Routes sharing one or two, maybe three maps, I can totally get that. But if the entirety of a route, save for one map, is the same as the others, it is aggravating beyond belief. And speaking of the narrative, the story struggles not just because of the maps, but because of the multiple routes. Crimson Flower, Edelgard's route, is probably my personal favorite because I have never felt so morally grey in a Fire Emblem game in my life. But I always, 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 always recommend going Golden Deer to anyone simply because it is the most contained story of them all. Still not perfect, but most everything is answered. Whereas in Crimson Flower, Silver Snow, and Blue Lions, there are a bunch of unanswered questions that drive me up the wall. It's another situation where they design the game around replay value, and it irks me just way too much. I love part one of Three Houses. It's very good. It sets up a potentially amazing story and has some rad twists within it. It's the highlight of Three Houses. Because once the time skip hits, it's all downhill from there, to be honest. The negativity is almost done, everyone. Just hang on. One, just one more thing. One more thing. I never made a video on this, so I'm fitting a feature-length film into this one spot in this video. The exploration addition to Three Houses was crisp. I have longed for the day Fire Emblem took from Shining Force and explored an exploration addition to the gameplay. And they did it. Ugh. <sighs> they did it. In Three Houses, you're able to explore the monastery you stay at. Cool, that's fun for an hour. But then it gets incredibly monotonous. It feels like a chore as soon as you hit the second part of the game. And I think it really, really degrades the quality simply because you're confined to one area. I would love to see the next Fire Emblem expand upon this and have the ability to explore an entire world. Okay, anyway, I'm, I'm done bashing this game, it's so... Oh, it takes so much energy bashing this game. I love this game, it's my number six spot. I, I really do love this game. There's just so many little things that add up. Let me just talk about the good things. The cast of Three Houses is phenomenal! Arguably the most memorable cast ever, because most every character has depth, has fantastic performances, and is involved in the living, breathing world of Fodlin. I'm Love Claude. The combat is really awesome as well, because it adds battalions that makes every battle feel massive. I love seeing dozens of soldiers on the field rather than just my unique units. And then the customization options for classes is super neat! While most characters kind of have a set path for classes, like Ignatz as an archer, Sylvain as a paladin, or Dorothea as a mage, 
It's fantastic that we have the ability to switch that up as much as we want. It's a beautiful thing that I hope Fire Emblem adopts going forward. The most important thing that made me love this game is the fishing mini game. Oh my goodness, this is this, this is god dear. This is this is three houses right here. That's this is the entire game. It's so good. I love three houses despite its flaws, and it promises a quality future for the franchise. But if we could take out the roots, that'd be pretty nice. Just make it one story, please. We've made it to the top five, everyone. Oh, that's fantastic. Oh my goodness. For number five, there's only one game that deserves this spot. Fire Emblem 5, Thracia 776. Huh, sounds like I just lost hundreds of viewers. Thracia 776 is the oldest game I have on my top 10 list. It was the last game that Kaga, the series creator, was in charge of. It is an older game from the 90s with dated mechanics. But the beautiful thing about this game is that it took all the things that early Fire Emblem games did well and doubled down on that quality. This game has been given the title the most challenging Fire Emblem, which I would absolutely agree with. I actually played on an easier difficulty, which there's no shame in doing, and I didn't struggle too much beyond the first few maps and the last pair of maps, that is. Thracia has a gigantic entry barrier. The first five or six chapters are incredibly difficult because of how divergent they are from the franchise. A guide is pretty much required to get through these maps. It's rough, but it does get better. <laughs> Beyond the first few chapters, you're treated to some of the absolute best maps in the franchise in my personal opinion. Yeah, there are still some duds, but there are so many bangers. Chapter 14 is the first one that comes to my mind. Then there's Chapter 8, Chapter 19, Chapter 16B. All of these maps are just fantastic and so well made and so fun. There are so many maps that filled me with joy. It's one of the most exciting experiences I've had with a Fire Emblem game. Of course, as mentioned before, the final two maps are just awful. I literally want to scream because of how terrible they are. But they do conclude the plot very well. Thracia 776 takes place during Genealogy of the Holy War, right in the middle of it. And it's such a riveting story, all about the little man Leaf taking back Thracia. It's not a very original story, but it's filled with great beats and some solid central characters. One huge blow to this game is that the side characters are incredibly irrelevant. I want to know more about my faves like Tanya, Dashin, Dagdar, Marita, and, and so many more. But when characters do show up in this mature and unforgiving plot, they're very good. Thracia is the greatest game made by Kaga. There is nothing else like it in the franchise. If you do try it, use a guide. I'm so thankful I had one of my greatest friends, Consono, help me through it. Play Thracia 776. What's more controversial than the hardest Fire Emblem game in existence? Anime! Here we go, Tokyo Mirage Sessions Sharp FE. I am one of the biggest Tokyo Mirage Sessions shills on the internet. I, I love this game so much. Tokyo Mirage Sessions, which I will now refer to as TMS because that's a jumble of jam I don't want to spit out every few seconds. It's a crossover between Shin Megami Tensei and Fire Emblem, and it's so anime. Anime is a f***ing abomination. Instead of being a tactical RPG, it's a turn-based RPG that focuses on combos. The game follows a group of idols in Shibuya who are secretly Mirage Masters, Warriors who fight demons within the idol industry. It's corny as hell, but I love it. A lot of Fire Emblem and Shin Megami Tensei fans despise this game because it's not the crossover they wanted. But for what it is, it's fantastic. A beautiful blend of anime tropes, comedy, emotion, and Shadow Dragon. 
because the plot is just a retelling of the original Fire Emblem story, except with idols. Which makes this objectively the best version of Shadow Dragon. This is so much better. The whole Japanese pop vibe turns people off and I understand, but the best part of this game is the surprisingly deep combat system. It's all about racking up combos with party members, using special attacks, and finding weaknesses. It's a lot like Shin Megami Tensei's combat, but flashier and significantly more fun. Sorry. TMS struggles with identity, as the first four chapters of the game focus on the idol industry and making it big, while the rest of the game smashes the Shadow Dragon plot in your face. So an inconsistent plot is part of people's frustrations, and I get that. But the game's biggest struggle is the protagonist, Itsuki. The most basic anime protagonist I have ever seen. He does nothing, except for sing the Fire Emblem main theme. That was pretty cool. I refuse to accept him as the protagonist because his love interest, Tsubasa, oh. is more at the forefront of the story. And she's just so much more interesting and relatable. Tokyo Mirage Sessions is great. You should try it if you haven't. I have an entire video talking about it. Check it out. There are a few games that make me feel so cozy. Pokemon Crystal, Breath of the Wild, and of course, Radiant Dawn. Ah yes, racism. How cozy. That's f up. Fire Emblem Radiant Dawn is the second game in the Tellius duology, the sequel to Path of Radiance, which stars my gay boy Ike. I fight for my friends. Radiant Dawn making my top three is quite miraculous because years ago I didn't even consider this to be my top five. I thought it was the worst Fire Emblem I had ever played, until one summer I spent most every day watching my brother go through both Tellius games, and I really warmed up to it. Unfortunately, this game is super divisive. It did some really, really, really interesting things through weaving narrative and gameplay that didn't land with everyone, and understandably so. There was also a faction of characters that kind of flopped because this game doesn't feature full-blown supports. Which is stupid. I can understand why they didn't add supports because you end up with like 70-something units, and Fire Emblem was falling to its death at the point. But still, there should have been supports. To address the bad, let's start from the beginning. The game focuses on this rad new character who I'm a huge fan of, named Makaya. She's besties with Soth, a character from the prequel. And they have a rebellion gang that's trying to save their damaged country, Dayan. This section overall has a very strong start narratively, but it's also lacking because it's dominated by new characters who get barely any development. Once Micaiah's initial story ends, the player is transported to another group of people, this time led by my favorite Fire Emblem character, Alincia, the Queen of Crimea. Ah, oh, Queen! Have I mentioned she's my favorite? God, I love her so much. None of the units in the previous 10 or so chapters return for this part, so it's very awkward character progression. Eventually, you do return to Micaiah's squad about 11 chapters later, and they're disgustingly underleveled. Switching between groups is a consistent thing in the game. While it works super well narratively, because you have the opportunity to view a chaotic war from multiple world leaders, the gameplay lacks because of it. The progression system is wonky and unbalanced, making this game sometimes too challenging for all the wrong reasons. I'm almost always willing to put up with bad gameplay if the plot is good enough. For example, I played Near Gestalt. That gameplay sucks, but the story blew me away. And that's the big issue with Radiant Dawn. The story is great, despite a few awkward hiccups with Micaiah and Sad Boy, but the gameplay is tragically broken. I can never and I will never fault someone for disliking Radiant Dawn for this reason. But damn, can we talk about Alincia's segment of the story? Holy nuts! She's given five chapters to deal with civil unrest in her kingdom, and it's a beautiful story with an epic conclusion 
The maps here are perfect, the political drama is top tier, and it's such a gripping narrative. I always refer to this part as peak Fire Emblem. Oh, oh I miss Radiant Dawn. I, I really want to play it now. Oh my goodness. The game isn't as perfect as Alintia's Gambit. Some maps are pretty, pretty rough. There's really annoying fog of war and some brutally unfair matchups. But going through the bad parts are worth it because it's another game with a Tellius cast. Most every character from Path of Radiance returns and they're given more development. I love this cast. I grew up with this cast. These are my babies. I love them. Tellius is just so perfect. But not as perfect as Alencia. God, Queen, I can't believe I dropped money on you and Heroes. You're so perfect. <sighs> I know this list is subjective, but I truly believe that Fire Emblem Shadows of Valentia is probably the best Fire Emblem to ever exist. No! Fire Emblem Echoes Shadows of Valentia is a remake of Fire Emblem Gaiden, the second game in the Fire Emblem series. And it's just phenomenal. The music, the cast, the plot, the presentation, it's all just top notch. But let's address the Dumbo in the room. <gasps> when remaking this game, they pretty much did a one-to-one -one remake of the maps. To put it nicely, they kind of really suck sometimes. I don't think they're as bad as everyone makes them out to be. I certainly prefer these to Three Houses maps. They're either wide open fields that require quite a bit of walking, or in a fortress with very awkward tight spaces, or in a swamp. A very slow swamp. I do think this is a little bit overblown. Just because they're empty doesn't mean they're bad. I think the first two and a half acts of this game have pretty alright maps. They're really not that bad. But once we reach the later half of Act 3 and Celica's entire side of Act 4, they aren't the best. I'm sure someone's gonna call me out as a hypocrite because I'm calling this the best Fire Emblem game and giving the maps a pass whereas I didn't do that for Three Houses or Genealogy. But Echoes just goes far above and beyond in every department compared to every single Fire Emblem game. The art style is goddamn phenomenal. Quite possibly my favorite art style in any game ever. It's fucking gorgeous. The cast is incredibly memorable because it has some of the best voice acting I have ever heard in a game. No. Please. Have mercy, sire. Your Excellency! Uncle! The music hits highs that only Awakening was able to reach. And the narrative, while nothing groundbreaking, is such a feel-good and emotional story that you can't help but cheer on the protagonist in their quest to save a dying world. All of this makes Shadows of Valentia have the best presentation in the series. It's such a shame this game got overlooked because of the lack of an avatar no romance options, and it releasing in 2017 when the Switch was the warm cookie everyone wanted. Paired with the excellent presentation is excellent combat. Perhaps my favorite combat system in the series. There isn't much customization when it comes to character builds, but forging weapons and discovering their super moves is so exciting, and this game does one thing that I don't think many people talk about, and I mentioned it earlier, but you don't have to bench anyone! This is groundbreaking! Benching units is always a very difficult thing for me to do. Shadows of Valentia hears this and makes it work so well, although there are sections where you are forced to bench a handful of units when exploring dungeons, but they're not long enough for me to get annoyed by it. And besides, the exploration function is marvelous, and it's that beautiful first step to a Shining Force styled open world I long for Fireboom to become. I love this game. I am literally begging you to bust out that prehistoric device of yours, the 3DS, and play this game. It's such a thrilling ride, with so many highs you won't find in any other. This music's so good, it's so comfy.
I just cried about how perfect Shadows of Lentia is. How am I going to make Path of Radiance sound better than that? Well, I don't really think I can. As mentioned before, I think Shadows of Valentia is the best game in the series. But I have such strong memories attached to Path of Radiance. I have dropped over 1,000 hours in this game. It sits up there with my other 1,000 hour games like RuneScape, Pokemon, and Sonic Adventure 2. I love Path of Radiance, and it sits comfortably in my top 10 games of all time. Nostalgia definitely plays a major role in that though. It all started one Saturday morning when my dad came home from the store with Path of Radiance. I didn't know anything about Fire Emblem beyond Marth and Roy and Smash Brothers. My dad had bought it because he read that it was the closest thing to Shining Force we would get in the West. I started it a few days later and fell madly in love with it. Thank you dad for changing my life and being the catalyst to my YouTube channel. Path of Radiance is all about the mercenary boy Ike becoming a princess's escort and felling a mad king. It's a rather simple plot, but the crevices within are filled with great details and fantastic character moments. That's one of the big draws to Path of Radiance in my opinion. The characters. Path of Radiance Ike is one of the best written lords in the franchise. He goes from angsty immature teen to a selfless mercenary leader. Grail, his father, I would argue is the best father archetype in Fire Emblem. His story affects the world in so many ways in this game, and its sequel. The best part about this cast? Just about everyone you recruit is relevant to the overarching plot. Of course, this is assisted by the game having a sequel, but I would argue that Path of Radiance gives meaning to 90% of its cast, even with limited supports like the GBA games have. They don't hide anything vital behind these supports. And it's not just the cast, it's the maps. The maps in Path of Radiance are the best in the series. Chapter 11, Blood Runs Red, will forever and always be my favorite Fire Emblem map. I can make an entire video talking about how much I love Blood Runs Red and how I think it's the best Fire Emblem map. There are so many other excellent maps. Daybreaks, Despair and Hope, Defending Talrega, even Clash. They're so good. But no game is perfect, except for Majora's Mask, obviously. Path of Radiance suffers from limited supports, meaning you miss great character interactions in the slowest enemy phases in existence. This game could really use a speed up button, my lord! Some other quality of life changes that Radiant Dawn introduced, like transferring skills, would be nice too. And you know, get rid of Makalov. Ah, he's the worst! He's the worst! The worst human being I- ah, the worst! Even with these faults, this is my favorite Fire Emblem game. Probably because it was my first Fire Emblem. It's a game I always go back to. It feels like it's on another level in terms of Fire Emblem games. It doesn't even feel like a Fire Emblem game. It's its own entity. I love it so very much. If it wasn't as expensive as Sin, I would tell everyone to go buy it right now. But uh, if you have a strong enough computer, it's a pretty cool game to check out if you know what I'm, <laughs> you know what I'm saying. Nothing in this series makes me happier than Path of Radiance. I love Tellius. I love Ike. I love Alencia Queen. Did I mention she was my favorite? Thank you all for watching. Now, just a reminder, this list is completely subjective. And everyone has their own list. I'd love to see yours. I won't even be mad if your favorite game is Fire Emblem 1. Or Sacred Stones. That's totally valid. Don't think that my list invalidates yours. I respect your opinion, as long as you respect mine. Thank you for watching this. That was a lot of words. I'm gonna go drink water for like three days now. <laughs>